On August 11, 1991, the NASCAR Winston Cup Series returned to Watkins Glen for the sixth consecutive Budweiser at the Glen. But just five laps into the race, 52-year-old J.D. McDuffie lost his life in an accident. Driving a race car is my way of making a living. J.D. McDuffie. My way of putting the bread on the table at home. John Delphus McDuffie Jr. was born in North Carolina on December 5, 1938. JD began racing in various dirt events throughout the Carolinas and had relative success. He won a track championship at a small dirt track near Rockingham. McDuffie always ran the number 70 in his dirt track days because it was easy to paint and easy to remember. After having some success in the late model sportsman division, JD eyed NASCAR's top series. In 1963, at the age of only 25, J.D. started his first NASCAR Grand National race at Myrtle Beach Speedway. J.D. only ran 113 of 200 laps, but was able to beat Richard Petty and Bobby Isaac because they had problems of their own. He finished 12th in an 18-car field. J.D. ran 11 more races in 1963, racing his own car, mostly in the number 76. J.D. wouldn't run in the Grand National Series again for three years until 1966. But that season, he ran 36 races and scored 9 top 10s. This was his first year running his iconic number 70 car. After entering only one race in 1967, McDuffie ran 161 races over the next 4 years with 39 top 10s and 3 top 5s in that span. At that time, if your name wasn't Pearson, Petty, Isaac, Allison, or Yarbrough, good luck winning a race. For example, in 1969, these names accounted for 53 of 54 race victories. But then came NASCAR's modern era. This was a tough transition for many drivers after the title sponsor Winston made sweeping changes in their first offseason. They cut all the short 250 mile or less races from the schedule, which made the schedule 31 races for 1972. Also, to be competitive or even make the races, you basically needed sponsorship now. McDuffie was able to get funding from a family engineering company, as well as many small local auto shops. JD attempted to qualify for all 31 races, but DNQ'd five times. He only scored two top 10s all season. JD wasn't nearly as competitive as he had been. But then 1973 was a different story. JD finished the 73 season with a remarkable 10 top 10s in only 27 races, with an average finish of 17.4, which was good enough to finish 10th in the final standings. So to say that JD was operating on a shoestring budget would be an understatement. According to Racing Reference, JD only had an outside primary sponsor for three races all season. Not to mention, his earnings from the purse netted him a mere $56,000 for the entire season. From 1973 to 1977, JD kept up his consistent finishes to finish in the top dozen in points four times in these five seasons. However, in 1978, things changed for McDuffie when he scored his first and only pole position of his career at Dover. Unfortunately, JD's engine expired just 80 laps into the race after leading the opening 10 laps of the race. After this moment, JD's performance started to dip, and that's to be expected. At this point, bigger teams started to come along with more money and resources. An independent owner like JD had no way to keep up. In spite of the lack of success and the chronic low budget problems, he continued his career with determination, which made him one of the most appreciated drivers by fellow drivers and fans. While other teams started hiring dozens of employees, JD personally drove his team's truck, did most of the mechanical work on his car, and often had only used parts to work with. His pit crew was usually made up of volunteer workers picked up at the track on race day. JD had a grit to him that racers today could never have dealt with. Thomas Pope summed up some of the struggles JD faced. I think the older cup guys, such as Richard Petty, Junior Johnson, and Richard Childress, had a lot of respect for JD because he was able to hang in there and run the cup series as long as he did. There were times when he would scuff in tires for Junior at places like Dover and tracks like that. 
JD could pit and they would run so many laps on them and come back in and take them off and Junior's guys would go down and get their tires back. Then they'd put them back on the cars driven by Cal Yarbrough, No Bonnet, or Darrell Waltrip, or whoever was driving for him. They probably gave him stuff to run that he couldn't have afforded even if it was used. They were more than willing to help him out just to keep him out there. They appreciated what he had to do to be there every week. In 1982, JD got a real break. Team owner Junior Johnson was well on his way to win the championship with Daryl Waltrip going into the last race as long as Waltrip actually made the race. As a safety net for Waltrip, Johnson entered an extra car for McDuffie to pilot in case Waltrip wrecked out in qualifying so that Waltrip could enter the race in McDuffie's car and still be guaranteed the championship. Waltrip qualified for the race, so McDuffie was able to race his competitive car. He qualified 14th, but only managed 18th in the race. But this had to be such a cool experience for JD. After the 1982 season, McDuffie never scored a top 10 again. By the late 80s, he was racing only a handful of races each season. In 1991, he entered Walkton's Glen after scoring a 22nd place finish there a year prior. However, no one could have foreseen what would happen early on in the race. Early on in the 1991 Budweiser at the Glen, JD was battling Jimmy Means. Jimmy stated, Actually, McDuffie was behind me when we went into that corner. He was racing me so hard. I remember commenting to myself, Dang JD, you're all over me. I remember thinking, JD is tough today. Unfortunately, entering the loop on lap 5, the left front wheel spindle on JD's car broke. This caused his wheel to fly off and for his car to lose its brakes. Jimmy Means was collected by JD's car and headed straight to the barrier as well. With only grass and a small tire barrier between JD and an Armco guardrail, JD hit the wall a ton. McDuffie's car did a full rotation in the air and landed on its roof. A nearly two hour red flag ensued after the crash, with this message being played just minutes before the race resumed. On the status of J.D. McDuffie, here is Chip Williams, the Director of Public Relations for NASCAR, and Chip, uh, what's the information? Jerry and, and Bill, I, I regret to inform you that uh, J.D. McDuffie has passed away, uh, he's 53 years old. Uh, of course, our hearts right now was his wife, Ima Jean, and, and, and his uh, children, Jeff and Linda, and it's... For the first time, a NASCAR driver was pronounced dead live in the middle of an event. Chip Williams brought the message to millions who were waiting to hear of JD's condition on air. Ernie Irvin went on to win the race and said this of JD. Great win here for you. Well, I tell you what, this is a great race team, and um, you know we've came back from a lot of deficits all year, and uh, you know we want to dedicate this race to JD McDuffie. You know he won the last race he was in, and um, great man, and um, you know it was hard to drive by that corner every lap, but. Um, we just want to dedicate this race to him. And, uh... McDuffie was supposed to have finished that race at Walkton's Glen and then drive his transporter, Old Blue, back to his race shop. Crew members from Junior Johnson's number 11 and number 22 teams drove Old Blue back to McDuffie's shop. McDuffie died instantly as a result of a basilar skull fracture. Dale Earnhardt, Adam Petty, Blaze Alexander, and Kenny Irwin Jr. would later die from basilar skull fractures as a result of their respective crashes. Walkton's Glen implemented the bus stop chicane before the loop in response to the accident, as well as a gravel trap. This gravel trap has since been paved over in favor of a tarmac runoff. When a young reporter in the mid-1980s asked McDuffie why he had five cigars in his driver's suit pocket, he said, I chew on one every 100 miles. If I make it to the fifth cigar, I've had a pretty good day. JD has the unfortunate record of most career starts without a win, and the most starts without a lead lap finish. On the surface, this looks really bad, but stats don't tell the story. Most fans know these statistics, but I wanted to shed some light on who JD was as a person, and how he was loved in the garage, and how he represented all the independent guys out there when the big budget team started to come into the sport. Race fans loved JD because he was a blue collar race car driver. They were amazed that he could race against the best in the world at NASCAR's highest level on the budget he had, using the parts and pieces that he had. He didn't have the high dollar sponsors all the other guys did, but teams helped him with what he needed. Somehow, he made it work for a very long time. 
Guys, that does it for this video. I hope you did enjoy. Make sure you let me know how you liked it down in the comments down below. If there's any other driver you want me to cover in another video, let me know that down in the comments down below as well. Alright guys, that's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, make sure you leave a like and subscribe. That's it for this one, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.